I'd like to first thank the organizers for the kind invitation to present some of our work on nitric oxide. Um, and so I've basically divided up this 30-minute talk in four sessions. So I'm going to make no assumption that I'm going to review very uh, briefly what, the, what nitric oxide is molecularly, I'll talk about its physiological roles, and then I'm going to talk about this new paradigm that's emerged over the past 10 or 15 years on how we regulate um, and maintain normal nitric oxide production. And then talk about some ways to diagnose nitric oxide insufficiency. It's been a problem in the clinic. There's not standard diagnostic laboratories to assess nitric oxide functionality. And then I'm going to talk about a few therapies and strategies to restore nitric oxide and actually combat disease and prevent disease, which I think what we're all charged to do. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I should admit I'm a founder and chief science officer for Neogenis Labs, a paid consultant for Bristol Myers Squibb, and uh, also have a financial interest in Sage Pharmaceuticals, which we're developing some small molecule uh, drugs for nitric oxide. And really, this is the heart of what we're getting at. And you, this audience obviously appreciates um, this, that chronic diseases account for about 61% of the deaths worldwide. It's recognized that most, if not all of these, are preventable by changes in diet and lifestyle modifications. So what I'm going to tell you over the next 25 minutes is really we think we've uh, begun to understand a mechanism of action for the cardioprotective benefits of uh, moderate physical exercise and the cardioprotective effects of certain diets and certain foods. So what is nitric oxide? It's a very simple molecule. In fact, it's one of the simplest in nature. It's one nitrogen, one oxygen. Uh, it's actually a gas that's produced by our endothelial cells and it has an unpaired electron in the outer orbital. Uh, and we call those free radicals. So most people associate free radicals with damaging uh, molecules in physiology and biology, but this is actually one of the good guys. It can actually scavenge other more potent, more uh, damaging oxygen radicals. So it's a gas. It's one of the most important signaling molecules in the body. Before the 1980s, before it was ever discovered that it's produced within our body, it was recognized as an air pollutant. And in fact, the first nitric oxide analyzers were um, in automobile industries where they would hook up an NO analyzer to the exhaust of cars, and it was a measure of incomplete combustion. So the, the discovery that nitric oxide, this once thought toxic molecule, was actually produced within our body really changed the way we thought about uh, physiology and medicine. And now over 130,000 papers have been published on nitric oxide, and it's basically involved in every biological function known. It's the main molecule produced by our white blood cells that kill off invading bacteria and viruses. It's the main molecule produced by our endothelial cells that line every uh, inch and centimeter of blood vessels uh, for maintaining normal blood pressure. It's a non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic signal in the, in the uh, peripheral nervous system. It's a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It affects apoptosis, angiogenesis, um, and it's also a main uh, signaling molecule in the uh, urogenital tract. And in fact, I'll show you a slide. It's really the mechanism of action for a lot of these PD-5 inhibitors uh, for erectile dysfunction. And so after the discovery of in really 1987 by Lou Ignaro that this uh, endothelium-derived relaxing factor was discovered to be nitric oxide, a short 11 years later, the Nobel Assembly awarded the Nobel Prize to Bob Furchcott, Lou Ignaro, and Fred Murad for, collectively for their discoveries around nitric oxide in the cardiovascular system. So I had the very fortunate opportunity to work with Lou Ignaro. Fred Murad actually recruited me to the University of Texas at Houston to join the drug discovery program. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about and the next 20 minutes revolves around us really trying to develop drugs around nitric oxide. And fortunately, we, we actually failed at that, but we have made some fundamental discoveries, I think, in, uh, in other ways to modulate nitric oxide production. So this is a schematic. If you can appreciate this single cell layer of endothelial cells that line every blood vessel in the body, when you have an increase in shear stress when you begin exercise, these uh, baroreceptors or mechanoreceptors on the endothelial cells then tell that endothelial cell to make nitric oxide. And the first pathway to be discovered was through an L-arginine-based pathway. And so <clears throat> this enzyme, nitric oxide synthase, when stimulated through a very complicated five-electron oxidation reaction, can, in some cases, produce nitric oxide. And then L-citrulline is a byproduct. And nitric oxide being a gas can then diffuse in all three dimensions. And part of that nitric oxide diffuses to the underlying smooth muscle. It binds and activates an enzyme called guanylocyclase. And then that guanylocyclase will convert uh, GM, GTP, the cyclic GMP, and through a calcium-dependent mechanism can dilate blood vessels, relax smooth muscles. And so when, when Big Pharma was trying to develop nitric oxide-based drugs, they thought one of the first primary targets would be this, these phosphodiesterase <clears throat> enzyme that basically degrades the cyclic GMP to inorganic uh, phosphate and, and GMP and then turns that signal off. 
So by virtue of inhibiting these phosphodiesterase inhibitors, if nitric oxide activates an enzyme, increases cyclic GMP, then these PD5 inhibitors can prevent that breakdown, and hence the, the increased uh, penile erections and, in some cases, the, the prolonged four-hour erections, which, which we're warned against.